Well, go ahead and open up your Bibles to the book of Colossians, Colossians chapter 3. We're going to be looking at verses 12 through 17 this morning. Colossians has been truly wonderful as we've seen the glory and the majesty of Jesus unfolded before us. We've seen his supremacy, we've seen his sufficiency demonstrated so clearly, and to reject Christ as God in the flesh is to reject what has been laid out so wonderfully before us. We've seen the wonderful work of Christ to strip away the old man and We've seen that when we enter into salvation, our old man died with Christ. Our old man died with Christ, and we were raised up a new man with Christ. We have a new identity with Christ. We are new creations. If you're a Christian, you do not have two natures. You have one nature, one new man in union with Christ, but you do live in your unredeemed flesh. We haven't been given our glorified bodies yet. When we are, we will sin no longer. But in this body, we revert back to that old way, old man way of living at times, not because we have to, not because we're enslaved to sin like we once were. And so now, as we make our way through the book of Colossians, things are getting particularly personal for us at the practical level. Paul's touching on specific areas of our lives, giving specific commands to aid us in living in light of our death and resurrection with Christ. There are practices we are to lay aside. We saw that last week, that we are to put to death. And there are virtues that we are to put on, and some in the Christian community have a hard time with commands. There is in many a rightful fear of legalism, but that unfortunately often leads to a rejection of God's commands that are good in our expressions of his love for us. God's commands for us are an expression of his love, and our love for God is expressed in keeping his commandments. That is to be the heartbeat of the Christian. And it's crucial to remember that the commands of Scripture for the believer are not for you to obey in order to attain a new identity, to attain salvation, to attain the resurrected life. Rather, he is calling us to live consistently with the new identity that we have been given, the new man that we are made in Christ. And this is the hard work of sanctification that every believer is called to, where we labor to put off the old man practices and to put on the new man way of living. And this is all enabled by the Spirit of God. He is working actively through us and also demands intentional active pursuit of holiness by us. So with this in mind, let's read together Colossians chapter 3. We're going to be looking at verses 12 through 17, starting in verse 12. Paul says, So, as those who have been chosen of God, holy and beloved, put on a heart of compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience, bearing with one another and forgiving each other, whoever has a complaint against anyone, just as the Lord forgave you, so also should you. Beyond all these things, put on love, which is the perfect bond of unity. Let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, to which indeed you are called in one body, and be thankful. Let the word of Christ richly dwell within you with all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another with psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with with thankfulness in your hearts to God. Whatever you do, in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks through him to God the Father." Last week, we saw that the believer's new self being united with Christ demands an end to the old self's way of living. Well, this morning, we see that the believer's new life being united with Christ demands a pursuit of the new man's way of living. The believer's new self being united with Christ demands a pursuit of the new man's way of living. In light of our union with Christ, there are practices, old man ways of living we are to put off. And as we will see this morning, there are new man pursuits we are to put on, things we are to put off and things we are to embrace. 
And the Christian life has implications leading to how we are to stop living and how we are to start living. How we are to no longer conduct ourselves, but also how we are now to conduct ourselves. And this morning we see that the believer's new self being united with Christ demands a pursuit of the new man's way of living. The first demand or pursuit for the new man's way of living is the call to, number one, put on essential virtues. Put on, number one, put on essential virtues. We see this in verses 12 through 14, and we'll start in verse 12. Paul's going to set forth another list of five. We saw two groupings of five in the list of things the believer is to put off in verse five and then verse eight. And here, Paul sets forth another list of what we are to put on. But before he unfolds these virtues, Paul explains how the believer is actually able to expect obedience to this command. Look at the beginning of verse 12. Paul says, so as those who have been chosen of God. And in this brief statement, we see richness as Paul summarizes the wonderful realities of the gift of salvation brought about Through Christ for the believer, both shutting down any accusation of legalism in these commands as they are in a response to God's unmerited favor and demonstrating where the enablement to actually follow these commands comes from. They come from God. The only reason we are set apart and loved by God is because the eternal sovereign God before the foundation of the world predetermined it. He chose us. This was God's initiative. We did not merit this choosing. We did not deserve this choosing. He did it by his own volition. And those he has chosen now because of his work are holy. That is set apart from the world. For God and those who he has chosen are beloved of God. And just think on that for a moment. You have, by the sovereign will of God, been chosen, selected, set apart for his purposes and are engulfed in his love. What a precious reality. And so Paul says, as one who has been chosen of God, holy and beloved, put on, put on. In light of this reality, in light of these truths of what God has done, put something on. In light of your union with Christ brought about by God's work, setting you apart under his love, put on these various graces. And Paul starts with his list of five. Now, before we look at these virtues, we need to understand this command to put on. What is Paul saying at here? What is he getting at? In verse 10, Paul spoke of the new man having been put on, and that was a reference to salvation. Here, Paul's call to put on these virtues is not for the purpose of salvation, but in response to it. This is to put on virtues that match our standing. This is to put on and be and experience what we are in fact. This command to put on is to be obeyed at once and is the personal responsibility of every believer. Each one of us is called to put on these virtues and to put on is to clothe oneself with. It is to be enveloped by. That's what we are to do with these virtues. We are to put them on and continue to wear these things. We are seeking not only to express these various virtues, but to be covered by them, with them. Like clothing we wear, where we go, these virtues go. They cover us. They are a part of who we are in practice. And the first virtue that we see is a heart of compassion. Do you see that there in verse 12? Put on a heart of compassion. To have a heart of compassion is to have the seed of our deepest emotions, our inner being, our heart, be characterized by compassion. Compassion is to have concern for others' misfortune. It's to be merciful. It's to pity others, to feel sympathy or have tenderness towards others. 
And next, Paul says, kindness, put on kindness. This is closely related to compassion and seems to be an external product of a heart of compassion. It is doing good or being generous towards others. This is the idea of grace abounding in you to the point that it, it mellows harshness and produces an uprightness or helpfulness or conduct that is for another's benefit. And possessing next, we are called to put on humility. Next on the list is humility. Humility describes a, a gentle attitude which bears up under offenses with patient submissiveness. It's unselfish. It's not preoccupied with self, but rather prefers others. And possessing true humility aids us in the next virtue, which is gentleness. Do you see that there? Gentleness. Gentleness is, is courtesy and meekness, not because you're weak, but because you're self-controlled. It's the opposite of divisive or defiant or harsh. You are willing to be a sufferer rather than an inflictor. You're willing to suffer pain, hardship, ridicule, and so forth, as opposed to being the inflictor of such things. The one who is gentle is meek. It's one who waives any rights they think they might possess. And then the last virtue in the list is that we are to put on patience. This is to be long-suffering. This person endures wrong and puts up with exasperating conduct of others rather than flying into rage or despair or desiring vengeance in various circumstances. The patient one endures ill treatment with no bitterness or wrath. There's no resentment in the heart of this one. And these five virtues are again to be put on. They are to envelop us. They're to cover us. They're to be characteristic of us. And then in verse 13, Paul gives two ways that these virtues are to manifest themselves. They're not the only ways that these virtues manifest themselves, but they're on Paul's heart and mind here as he says, to bear with one another. Bearing with one another. That's the first we see here. And Paul uses the present tense in this participle, demonstrating that this is a, this is a constant necessity in our relationships with one another. And to bear with is to put up with difficult people or circumstances. This bearing with one another is to be reciprocal. We just do it with one another. We bear with one another as we are difficult with each other. You know what's assumed here? What's implied? Have you ever gotten an instruction that kind of feels a little bit backhanded? Hey, come work on this project. It's for the incompetent people. Okay, maybe I'm the only one who's ever gotten that task. <laughs> like, wait, oh, okay, wait a minute. Uh, to bear with one another implies that we all need bearing with. That's just the reality. That's the reality of body life. We're going we're gonna to hurt each other. We're going to be difficult at times. And the call is for us to bear with one another, to patiently endure, to put on those five virtues and have them flow out of us in the midst of difficulties and hardships. We are to be gracious, to endure each other. We don't run from each other the moment someone does something we don't like. We don't bolt because there's disagreement or hardship. We endure. And not only are we to bear with one another, but we're also to forgive each other. Whoever has a complaint against anyone, we give freely and graciously forgiveness or pardon. Whatever we believe we are owed in response to another's fault, we release that in our hearts and our actions from any sort of obligation. That is how we are to conduct ourselves with one another. We are to characteristically and habitually extend grace to each other, not holding our offenses against each other, and Christ is the standard. Do you see that in verse 13? Christ is the standard. Bearing with one another, forgiving each other, whoever has a complaint against anyone, just as the Lord forgave you, so should you also. Also. 
Christ is the standard. We are to be a church body who practices this among ourselves. We are to characteristically and habitually extend grace to each other, looking to Christ, remembering Christ. And how good is it for our relationships with each other to intentionally and regularly remember and ponder the forgiveness that we have received from Christ? When we talk about preaching the gospel to ourselves, this is a very practical application of what that looks like to remind ourselves of the forgiveness that we have received from Christ, that that would motivate and drive and encourage us to extend similar forgiveness to one another. And then Paul says in verse 14, beyond all these things, or as the superlative virtue put on love, look at verse 14. Beyond all these things, put on love, which is the perfect bond of unity. And it seems Paul is pointing to the fact that love is the binding virtue. Without it, these other virtues fade away, but with it, like a sash, which physically binds or holds tightly on and together one's clothing, love binds all of these virtues, unifying them together perfectly to accomplish God's purposes among and within his people. We are to envelop ourselves with all of these virtues, but love secures them in place. It is the binding together in unity of these things completely. How are you doing? This is, these, these are sobering instructions. And, and if ever there's been a year to have opportunity to put these things into practice, to be able to have revealed where our heart is at in these things. This has been the year. As a pastor of this church, I'm so blessed and grateful for the way that these virtues do manifest themselves so frequently in the lives of our body. But it's good for each of us to take personal inventory, to evaluate where our heart is at, and to press on to pursue still more. The believer's new self being united with Christ demands a pursuit of the new man's way of living. The first way of living was to put on essential virtues. And the next, in verses 15 through 17, we see the new believer's new self being united with Christ, that it demands that we embrace essential practices. I'm sorry, embrace essential priorities. That's number two, embrace essential priorities. And we see three priorities that we are to embrace. In verse 15, it is the peace of Christ. In verse 16, it is the word of Christ. And in verse 17, it is the name of Christ. Let's start in verse 15 with the peace of Christ. Look at verse 15. Paul says, let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, to which indeed you were called in one body, and be thankful. Paul gives the command here to let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts. And this, again, is a command that expects action to be taken immediately and habitually. The peace of Christ is to rule and to continue to rule in the hearts of his people. The peace of Christ is the peace which Christ gives or the peace that comes from Christ, and this peace is to rule. That is, it is to preside, it is to direct or control It is to govern you, and the domain where this peace is to reign is within our hearts, in the core of our being, the place from which our intellect and volition and emotion flow out of is to be ruled by peace that comes from Christ. Now, what is this peace of Christ? This is an inner calmness of mind and a deep tranquility of heart. This is is where once stress and trouble reigned in our hearts and ruled in our hearts in the depths of our soul, now steadiness rules. You're not upended by trouble or hardship or difficulty. This peace is a gift from Christ. And we know that Christ himself is our peace and that as we are grounded and rooted in him and united with him, this peace which he brings into our lives is to take up residence in our hearts. And Paul says, let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts. And then look at what he says next. To which indeed you are called in one body. The one body we are called to is both the sphere, it is both the sphere and element in which the peace of Christ is to reside and be realized. 
to be lived out. Each of us at Grace Bible Church is called individually to this command, but God in commanding each of us individually has called us collectively to be part of one body where this is manifested and realized. This peace of Christ is to rule all of us as we relate to one another. When we bear with each other, the peace of Christ is to rule. When we forgive each other, when we work through difficulties, the peace of Christ is to rule in our hearts in those things. And again, this may be a good time for a moment of just personal evaluation and inventory. What has been ruling in your heart? In the midst of all the difficulties and challenges of COVID-19, social issues, politics, and many other challenges that we have faced this year, where are the holes in your life where the peace of Christ, the, the peace that Christ brings, has not been ruling in your heart? Paul adds a brief additional command that has significant implications when followed. Look at the end of verse 15. He says, and be thankful. And thankfulness is to be the constant disposition of our hearts and minds. There's never a time when we're justified to not be thankful. And as we seek to live as part of the body to which we are connected, it is to be the default inclination of our hearts, one of gratitude. And as we seek to let the peace of Christ rule in our hearts, a continual thankfulness will aid us and steady us as whatever difficulty we face, we face it with the right perspective and a difficult and a thankful disposition. The next essential priority is found in the command of verse 16. This is the priority of the word of Christ. Look at the beginning of verse 16. Let the word of Christ richly dwell within you. If in the last priority, you were thinking, how do I have peace of Christ? How do I have the peace of Christ rule in my heart? How am I thankful at all times? Then, then this command will be particularly helpful. Paul navigates us directly into the path of peace and gratefulness with this command to let the word of Christ richly dwell within you. What is the word of Christ? Most succinctly, it's scripture. While the peace of Christ is to rule in our relationships with each other, the word of Christ is to dwell in our midst. To have the word of Christ richly dwell is crucial as personal opinions must yield to Christ's word. How we feel about various issues must submit to Christ's word. Individual ideas must bend to Christ's instruction. And when this is happening among God's people, the peace of Christ is much more easily attained. As the people of God, when we gather in fellowship and worship together, the word of Christ is to be prominent and to have an abundant presence in our midst. It is to take a primary place. Paul follows up this command. Look again at verse 16. Let the word of Christ richly dwell within you with all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another with psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with thankfulness in your hearts to God. Paul says, with all wisdom, teaching, and admonishing one another, this seems to be the means by which the word of Christ is to dwell among us. There's corporate instruction or teaching and admonishing or warning for giving instruction regarding belief and behaviors that is to take place with one another. This is done in all wisdom as we care for each other centered on the word of Christ. This has to be a primary priority, and Paul adds with psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, this is a crucial means, not the exclusive means, but an important means of our teaching and our admonishing one another. It is our singing together. Our singing together as a church is both vertical as we worship and extol God and horizontal as we instruct and admonish one another. Our singing on Sundays is not only to warm our hearts individually, but to testify, instruct, and edify the body as a whole. This comes out in psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs, and it seems that Paul is not giving a specific prescription of exclusive styles for corporate singing, but rather demonstrating in these terms the variety and richness of Christian singing. 
And obviously the primary point here is that our singing is to be an expression of Christ's word richly dwelling among us and within us. Thus, any song that is distant from realities of Scripture simply is counterproductive to what we're instructed to do and sing. And then again, we sing with thankfulness in our hearts. We see the importance of recognizing that we are under God's grace. Our singing is not only to be lip service, but heart-moved proclamations rooted in thanksgiving. And then lastly, verse 17 we see the last of the essential priorities we are to embrace, and it's the priority of Jesus' name. Look at verse 17. Whatever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks through him to God the Father. Paul really sets forth a sweeping statement that covers the whole of the Christian life and has a summarizing effect of what has been instructed in verses 12 through 16, he says, whatever, literally in the Greek, it reads, all that anything if you do. It's just a way of encompassing all possibilities. All possibilities. He's making his instruction so broad that it gathers all the realms of scenarios, both possible or hypothetical. It, it shuts down the what if question. If you have if you have kids, you likely know the what if question. When you tell your child not to hit their siblings, and they go, well, what if the most poisonous spider in the world crawls on their arm, and in order to save them, the only possible means to killing the spider is if I actually hit them. What if that happens? <laughs> Paul, in this statement, actually shuts that down. It, He's calling for an eager heart to obey the command. He's not looking. He's not leaving opportunities for the exception. It's a heart that's fixated on complete inclusion. Do everything, whether words or deeds. Every individual word and action is to be brought under the microscope of this command. This is a fully inclusive instruction that everything is to be done in the name of the Lord Jesus. To do something in his name means that all that we do is done in dependence upon him, relying on his strength and power, and is done for his glory and purposes. We are to have a constant awareness of our union with Christ that leads us to do everything in our speech and actions, words, in accordance with and in conformity to his character, his revealed will for his people. We are to live for the glory of another as we bear his name. This is the practical outworking of Paul's instruction in chapter 2, verse 6, where we are called to walk in Christ. Do all things. In word or deed, do everything in the name of Jesus. That is to act consistently with who he is and what he desires. We are to live wholly devoted to his glory. And then again, three times in three verses, an emphasis, an emphasis on thankfulness. Paul closes this thought with the phrase, giving thanks through him to God the Father. There is to be a regular, consistent unfolding of thankfulness in our lives and all of our words and works. Everything we do, everything we get to do or say for Jesus is an immense privilege for which we are to give thanks. The least duty for Christ is more glorious and worthy of thanks than the greatest deed done for anyone or anything else. And so a heart of compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, patience, bearing with each other, forgiving each other, love, the peace of Christ ruling in our hearts, the word of Christ richly dwelling within you, every single act done in word or deed said and done in the name of Jesus is an immense privilege to put on, and it is consistent it is, called, it is the consistent practice of the new life, the resurrected life, the life in union with Christ that we have been given. Jesus is to be the sum and substance of our lives and to live un, under his lordship for his glory is a wonderful thing. This list of things we are to put on are not detrimental for us. They are not a hardship for us. These things are an expression of God's love for us 
and are for our good. These virtues do not withhold anything good and grant to us an honor beyond comprehension as we live for the glory of Christ's name. That is a wonderful thing. Let's pray. Father, we thank you so much for your choosing of us, for your work in us, that we have died and our life is now hidden in Christ and we have been raised up with him. Help us to walk in these realities. We pray in Christ's name. Amen.